On March 25th, oh, excuse me, March 23rd, Mayor Eric Garcetti issued a temporary moratorium on evictions. What does that mean? How can tenants handle that? Well, fortunately, I've got the experts in the room. I'm delighted to be joined by uh, Rushmore Cervantes. He's the general manager of the Housing and Community Investment Department, as well as Anna Ortega. She is the director of the Rent Division. All right, so I just said moratorium to right. tenants. What does that mean? Right. What is that actual uh, issue from the, what, from the governor as well as the mayor? As well as the mayor, right, correct. Well, Maria, first of all, thank you very much for bringing us to uh, the studio that we can talk about this because there are a lot of concerned people in the city of LA, around the state, across the country as well. Uh, just this morning, the unemployment uh, numbers were released. Another 6.6 .6 million people mm -hmm. filed for unemployment. That means within the last three weeks, we've had 17 million people become unemployed. It's a serious crisis, and as such, now people are concerned about how they're going to pay their rent. Mm -hmm. And obviously the governor, as well as the mayor, realized there was a serious crisis. How are we going to be able to protect the integrity of our community, make sure people continue to have housing? So the mayor introduced an order backed by the council with subsequent ordinances to ensure that tenants are not displaced as a result of not being able to pay their rent associated with the COVID virus. That means also that if perhaps they have a, a, a one, someone they're caring for at home who's ill the, that the, and they can't work, their income has been reduced, uh, or there's a government order for some reason to be able to, that they have to uh, shut down uh, any potential work they, have, they can uh, have access to they cannot be displaced. The other thing is, is that uh, property owners cannot remove those, those uh, apartments uh, from the rental market. Uh, the state of California has what they call an Ellis Act, mm -hmm. wherein property owners can remove their properties from the housing market. There's a freeze on that as well to ensure that people that are in their homes can remain in their, their homes of their units right now for the, for the foreseeable future. Furthermore, they don't have to pay their rents until such time that this COVID-19 crisis is behind us. Now, let me be make clear that that does not mean that they don't have to pay rents at right. all. This is just merely a forbearance. Right. And that the tenants in the city of Los Angeles will have up to a year to repay those arrearages and those rents. I mentioned that it's a state moratorium as right. well as a city moratorium, but there are differences. Yeah, there are slight differences in the state of California order versus the city of LA's, and the city of LA's it takes it a little bit further to ensure the additional protections that are provided across uh, the, the region. Specifically, the, the, the one-year re repayment uh, is also important to note, specifically for landlords as well as tenants, is that right now there isn't a requirement to provide documentation as it relates to why you are unable to pay your rent, meaning you've, your number of hours you're working have been reduced or you've lost your job altogether. So this is basically a notification is required of the tenant to the landlord to let them know there's a seven day window that, that post uh, rent. Obviously we would prefer they do that in advance of the, the rents being due, but certainly have within seven days to be able to provide that information uh, to their, proper, the, their landlord or the property owner so they're aware of what's going on. Uh, the city of LA and H said specifically uh, taking the, the mantle to try to figure out a way to administer this is going to be taking calls uh, or uh, email complaints from tenants, making sure that if they feel like they are, their landlord is illegally evicting them or evicting them for non-payment, we have housing investigators that will ins in investigate the situation. Uh, work with the tenants to find out what the situation is, uh, what type of income they've lost, why they cannot pay their rents, and then provide, based on a f a f affirmation of those facts, be able to provide a letter to the landlord and the tenant, basically that can be utilized a as an affirmative defense for that tenant in case they have to go to court to defend themselves. Now, by and large, the state of California said that no writs can be uh, introduced uh, for evictions at this time as well as the court systems, uh, they're down to just, you know, merely just critical cases right now. So e even if a landlord wanted to evict right now, it would be dif uh, difficult for them to do so just because the courts aren't open. Our, our position is, is we need to make sure, like this program this morning, is, is that we get the word out to both the landlords and tenants to ensure that they know what their rights are. Again, knowing that they have to repay this down the line, but certainly that the, the landlords also know that that they have to be able to work with their tenants as well. So this is this is a, an environment where we need to protect everyone's interests and rights, not only the tenants but also the landlords. That's an amazing amount of information in a very short period of time. But let's get into some of the details. Mm -hmm. You were talking actually about if people have problems and they want to contact you. So as far as your as far as the housing and community investment department is concerned, it's an 
advocacy group, it's an informational organization. What exactly is the role of this organization? Essentially, as a government entity, we are not advocates. We are there to inform constituents of the, the, the order as of right now. We don't play a role relative to uh, any kind of legal proceedings. Uh, the order is what it is. It doesn't mean that landlords may not necessarily uh, try to evict. It doesn't mean the tenants may not necessarily s start doing things illegally in those units right. that would still be subject to potentially evictions, but by and large there's an overall moratorium on evictions as a whole. There would just be minor case-by-case uh, -case scenarios in which tenants could be evicted, but by and large uh, tenants' rights are protected right now to ensure that they are not evicted. Well, and 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 I want to get to you because, you know, you have some, I'm sure you're getting an inundated with questions from a wide range of people and a wide range of subjects. So what happens if, if someone is in that process of getting evicted? What if they were, you know, somewhere down the line or what if they get an eviction notice during this moratorium? What should they do? First of all, they should be aware that uh, most evictions in the city of Los Angeles are not permissible right now. Um, it, it's not okay to evict tenants for non-payment of rent, for instance, as Rush men mentioned, if it's due to a reduction in wages or loss of income related to COVID or because they're having to stay home to take care of their children or take care of dependents. There are also no-fault evictions are not permissible. Um, also, um, if the reason, the alleged reason for the eviction is because the, there's a nuisance related to too many people in the unit or pets in the unit or children playing and being noisy in the unit, none of those are permissible right now. So if that happens to a tenant, uh, first of all, they should tell their landlord that they, they're aware of their rights and that um, that is not legal under the City of Los Angeles ordinance right now. But the housing department, um, has a role in enforcement of these laws. So we have a dedicated staff of housing investigators as well as customer service staff. All of our staff has been redeployed to basically customer service and investigations functions. So they should call us and file a complaint that they're getting evicted, they've gotten some kind of notice. They can call us at 1-866-557-7368 or they can file the complaint online on the um, HCIDLA website, which is hcid.lacity.org. Uh, so there's a place there where you can file a complaint online, and what will happen is uh, the tenant's concerns will be assigned to a housing investigator who will look into the what's going on, how that squares with the law, will uh, work with the tenant to try to obtain any documentation that the tenant may have, and uh, we'll inform the landlord that these evictions are not permissible right now. I'm not sure there's an answer to this, but what if the eviction was already in process? What if there was already something happening that uh, was causing, you're, you're, it's, an eviction is usually a three month period, am I not mistaken? But it goes to court at a certain date. I see. And right now the courts are not meeting for, um, for these kinds of, of legal matters. So it's probably on hold just, just, just in a practical in sense. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would say if something was already in process, it depends on where it is in the process, what that was for, and what date it was filed. Because most of these eviction protections go back to this, uh, the date of the declaration of the emergency in the city of LA, which was March 4th. Right. And now I've, I didn't realize there were multiple reasons or multiple <laughs> terminology when it comes to the word eviction. Mm -hmm. You know, you mentioned the Ellis, I, uh, the Ellis Law, you mentioned uh, no fault. So what are, the, what are the categories and what do they actually mean and what do they include? Okay, so basically there's two kinds. There's, okay. there's uh, tenant at fault, which is when tenants don't pay their rent or have somehow broken their lease or are doing some illegal activity in the unit. Those are all tenant caused types of evictions. Many of them are on hold now, again, because the principal one for of all evictions at, at all times is non-payment. But right now, if the reason for the non-payment is related to the emergency, those are all not permissible and are on hold. The other kind is uh, no fault. And so 
tenants even under the rent stabilization ordinance can be evicted for no fault reasons. Really? That is, the tenant hasn't done anything wrong, but the landlord, for instance, wants to move in themselves or wants to move in a resident manager or wants to take the uh, rental unit off the rental housing market to demolish it or convert it or something like that. The city council did adopt an ordinance that uh, disallows all no-fault evictions and just about all at-fault evictions. So there's a real pause right now. Uh, the city is really making every effort to keep tenants housed and in their homes. I think it's important to note also because we primarily deal with apartments but this addresses both uh, tenants in apartments but also townhomes, condominiums as well as single-family residences. So really? this is a statewide uh, moratorium. Um, along those lines, I mean if someone has lost their job because of the coronavirus, COVID-19, what kind of documentation do they have to provide to their landlord? Does it have to be official? Does it have to be legal? Does it, can it just be a note, a letter, an email, a text, or something that allows the landlord to understand the circumstances? The city order does not require documentation to be provided by the tenant to the landlord. Uh, however, uh, down the line, let's just say post-COVID-19, if this persists or there's a non-payment uh, uh, situation, the landlord would take that tenant to court and at that time that tenant would have to provide documentation. So our recommendation to tenants when they do call in or email, even though they don't necessarily have to provide the, uh, the documentation right now, we first of all, we again, we want to make sure they're, they're being uh, communicative with their, their property owner or t uh, landlord. Two, that they are collecting the information because it may come up down the line that they do have to provide that. But this right now, because of this crisis, we're not going to get into the weeds as far as documentation. It would take far too long to go through that process. It, down the line, because we're allowing them an opportunity to repay within 12 months, uh, that, that should address that. But of course, there are going to be case-by-case -case, uh, situations wherein they may get taken to court post-COVID-19. And of course, in order for a judge to be able to make a decision, they're going to have to weigh the balance of, of, of evidence, and it would require the, the, uh, the tenant to be able to provide that documentation. And, but Anna, you know, I realize that, and we all know that Los Angeles is a very <coughs> unique environment, and we do have residents who are hardworking residents that perhaps won't have documentation because of the fact that they are undocumented in general. So, and I know that this is a very large concern and how are those people going to be protected if they in fact cannot demonstrate to their landlord that they had lost their job because of COVID-19? Um, I would like to stress that the protections that the city has adopted both in this emergency time, but also in our ordinance and the rent stabilization ordinance, these protections apply regardless of immigration status. So uh, we help all tenants regardless of that. Uh, and we do understand that in some circumstances they uh, may not have the same documentation. For this COVID emergency, no documentation is necessary. All that tenants need to do is notify their landlords that they are unable to pay the rent. Um, and we have a sample letter on our website and there, they, various tenant organizations have sample letters on their website where they just have to let the, the, the landlord know. Um, they can also say whatever they can. It could be a letter from um, their child's school that says, you know, mm. um, classes are cold, cl closed and we're doing homeschooling or mm -hmm. there's all kinds of things it doesn't, that, that people could come up with. It doesn't have to be specific financial documentation. We're advising for their own protection that tenants, all tenants, maintain whatever records they, they can get their hands on that are relevant. But right now, they do not have to provide that to their landlord. And I realize that this was a question that was provided to us, you know, through our fellow media at Univision. And so, would you be gracious enough to maybe say that briefly in Spanish for our guests that would be watching in Spanish? Of course. So, las leyes uh, que protejan a los inquilinos aplican uh, a todos los inquilinos y familias, irrespectivo de su uh, estado de inmigración y nuestros eh, investigadores hablan español y pueden uh, tener tra traducción a otros, uh, otros idiomas, 
para que podamos uh, ayudar a, a todas las familias que necesitan ayuda. Pueden hablarlos, hablarnos a, a nuestro número, número de información al 1-866-557-7368 y hay allí um, operadores uh, bilingües que pueden ayudarles uh, con información y, y obtener su información para que para que pongan una queja uh, uh, de lo que está haciendo su, su arrendador. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I really appreciate that. I'd like to add something. You've heard uh, Anna uh, mention rent stabilization ordinance, and for those that may not necessarily know, in the city of Los Angeles, the rent stabilization ordinance covers apartments that were built prior to October 1st, 1978. Now, ordinarily, under uh, the non-COVID-19, there are specific uh, protections that are provided, provided to tenants under the uh, RSO properties. The current order covers across the board, but this important distinction that for people that are watching is is that tenants need to make sure they find out whether they are living in an RSO building or not. The reason why I say that is because in addition to the protections that are already covered by the state order as well as the local order, under the RSO, rent freezes uh, are in place for all RSO properties. Okay. And that represents about 80 to 85 percent of the multifamily housing stock in the city. So that's equally Im important as it relates to not only if the fact they can't pay their rents now, but also down the line when they do have to repay, that that amount won't be increased as a result of an increase. So in addition to that, what happens if someone's rent was scheduled to go up on April 1st? I mean, how is all that going into play? If it's, if it's an RSO property, then it, that will not go into effect. Okay. But if it wasn't, say it was built in the period of time that does not qualify, mm -hmm. are landlords allowed to raise rent at this moment in time? I don't, I don't think there's a provision or any kind of protections for that, is there, Anna? There's the rent freeze in the city of Los Angeles applies yes. at this time only, only to, to RSO. RSO. Right. And if uh, someone wants to know, maybe they're not sure about their property, we have this nifty tool called Texit. Um, residents can text RSO to 855-880-7368. So you just text RSO and then it, it's an interactive text um, app that will say, ask you for the address and say yes LA, or no. You know, that's wonderful. That. That's terrific. And again, this applies just to the city of LA. Obviously, the city of LA is one of 88 cities in the county of Los Angeles. I was going Angeles. to ask you specifically because right. um, you, the governor does have uh, the moratorium in the city and mm -hmm. Mayor Garcetti has. So what are the cities that are included in the city of Los Angeles's jurisdiction? Well, there's only one city of LA and there's 87 other cities, such as included. San Fran, no, just, a, just the city of LA. Within the county of LA, 88 cities, city of LA is the largest by, by uh, a long shot, but then you've got Long Beach, San Fernando, Culver City, that are not part of the city of LA, but they, they do fall under the, the governor's state order. Maybe I need to rephrase this, because there are areas of Los Angeles mm -hmm. that mi one might not necessarily distinguish as being, like I was saying mm -hmm. earlier, that North Hollywood right. is considered city of Los Angeles, right. and yet just a couple blocks down, yeah. you have Burbank. So sure. the geographic area, I guess, maybe would have been a better question. Yeah, well, well, I think that it, rather than going through each of the cities, because you know there's, there's a, lot. a lot in the city of LA as well. You know, they're not necessarily by name; they're still legally city of LA, whether it be Woodland Hills, Canoga Park. They're still city, city. of LA. So uh, all the more important uh, importance is for the tenants uh, to to contact or email or text the city of LA to find out, in fact, they are in the city of Los Angeles. And then, furthermore, is their property yeah, no, subject to the RSO? So I, we encourage anyone that's watching this, if you're not sure, give us a call, send us an email, text us, and we'll provide you the information. And furthermore, they feel like th they're, they're being squeezed out, they're, they're getting received a notice from the landlord, and they're concerned, they don't know how to address it, give us a call, we'll help them. Is there a general stat on how many evictions take place within the city in, in a given month? I mean, is it a profound number, or is it a nominal number, or are we expecting, do you expect a lot or a little, or? in a general sense when it's a non-pandemic scenario? Right. Yes, we've been looking at this. Um, eviction data is maintained on the county level. Got it. So the, you know, it's a bigger, bigger geographic area than the city, but in the county, in a year, roughly, there's about 55,000 evictions oh a year. 
uh, we've been sort of extrapolating that of the city's share that might be 25,000, 30,000 of those evictions. Most of them are for non-payment. Right. Um, so again, right now, those would all be on pause during the COVID emergency. Right. And you've mentioned this a few times, but let's get into the details mm -hmm. about the repayment. Mm -hmm. So as you said, this is not forgiveness. Correct. This is actually just a pause, this is a forbearance. So how does one work out mm -hmm. the repayment mm -hmm. over the period of time that's allowed through the city? The state uh, order does not specify. However, the city of Los Angeles, the mayor and council give a further instruction for HCID, our department, to come up with a, uh, an agreement that landlords and tenants uh, could utilize to be able to figure out a, a repayment plan. Okay. There's nothing specific. Uh, the property owner cannot demand full repayment of the arrearages all at uh, once. All at once know, yeah. and they have up to 12 months. So we're recommending to the landlords and tenants post COVID-19 that they work together to try to figure out a re repayment plan within that 12 month period, what, to figure out what's gonna work for them on an individual basis. There's no legal requirement for the property owner and tenant to enter into an agreement, but we're highly encouraging that so that we can uh, address any kind of misunderstandings 12 months after the COVID crisis is over so to ensure that we're protecting the, the tenants as well as the landlords. Because there are a lot of landlords who are, you know, that's their that's their income. Correct. You know, they have a, a, an, a one apartment complex or they have a home that they're renting out, mm -hmm. etc. So I would imagine that as this is a moving target and mm -hmm. things are progressing, um, landlords need to be completely aware of what's happening as yes. well as the mm -hmm. tenants. Right. Well, we uh, at HCID, when we roll out with programs uh, per the direction of the mayor and council, we're always working with tenant advocates, but also property owners associations. So we're constantly speaking with both sides of the house to ensure that when we come forward with policies, procedures that will, uh, will to implement new orders, we, we try to balance the, the approach to protect all that are interested because we understand that in order to have, a, you know, a, a thriving community, a thriving economy, we need to make sure that we have livable space affordable space, but also uh, businesses that can make uh, a decent return as well. So in as much as that the initial response to the COVID-19 was, as I mentioned earlier, the tremendous number of job losses or the underemployment that we're seeing right now, people are nervous in addition to their health, but just how they're gonna pay their bills. So this was the initial response to the crisis to maintain housing. Uh, the city, the county, the state continue to look at different ways to be able to work with banks to figure out ways for the property owners to get perhaps a forbearance on their mortgages, their, 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 their notes on those apartments. I do know that the federal level, those that are uh, owned uh, by the government alone, such as Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, mm -hmm. as well as those that are guaranteed, such as FHA or the Department of Agriculture, or the Veterans Administration, they have a permissible six months forbearance and an additional six months thereafter upon request. So they're already, the federal government's already thinking from that standpoint, how do we relieve the pressure on, on, the, on the, uh, the property owners to ensure that they can maintain their properties as well? I would imagine that all of this, since it's new, mm -hmm. changing, and we don't know what the ultimate outcomes are sure. going to be, communication is key. Mm -hmm. Do you suggest that tenants at least pay a portion or you know a good faith amount mm -hmm. or is it clear in the long run to just say given the current circumstances i will not be able to pay my rent this month period that's a personal decision on on their end uh you know it depends on what their circumstances are or yeah. the relationship with yeah, and the name. relationship exactly but uh, the the current order does allow them not to repay uh i think in order to relieve any potential significant burden on the back end to repay if this goes on for three or four months uh, to be able to have to repay four months worth of rent in addition to your existing rent within a 12-month period that's going to be rather onerous so uh, it, it would probably be wise to perhaps if they can afford to pay a little bit uh, pay down that rent and that would eliminate or reduce the amount that they're going to owe uh, at the end I'm sure you've said this earlier but the period of time the moratorium is the length of time as it stands right now is from what to what 
Well, it's actually through March 31st as of right now, uh, and it could get continued thereafter. But then, again, once the, once the is the crisis is deemed over, then at that point there'll be 12 months in which the tenants can repay those loans. I'm sorry, the the, the rent that was not paid. Got it. And what are some of the questions that you're getting? Because I imagine that you know there are a million questions that are coming in constantly um, with people who are trying to figure this out because it's new to yeah. everyone. I'll let Anna answer, answer that question, but I think it's important to know also we've expanded our call center hours oh. Monday through Friday as well as even on weekends because the, the, the people that are concerned, certainly as we're leading up to April 1st when the rents were due, the call went up significantly. But it's not just landlords, but as tenants as alike. So sure. uh, Anna can kind of fill you in some of the specific questions we're getting. Though. Yeah. Gosh, I think you've covered uh, <laughs> quite a few of them. Um, let's see, we're getting asked about do I have to provide documentation right. at this time? My landlord is insisting that I provide him or her with documentation. The answer is no, you do not at this time have to provide your landlord with documentation. You should inform him that you are unable to pay the full rent. Um, to one of your earlier questions, if te tenants this is not a permanent waiver of the rent. Right. So I, I do think, as Rushmore said, it's a personal decision and not everyone's in a different financial situation. So it may be that, um, that renters can afford some rent, maybe all the rent, partial rent. Uh, I'd also like to point out that I've really been hearkened by the response of some of the landlord groups, such as the Apartment Association of, of Los Angeles. They have on their website, they're encouraging their members to, um, to perhaps consider a rent reduction. I think that's, you know, I think this is really a time when landlords and tenants need to communicate with each other and work together and, and work something out that, you know, that making the best out of this Right. difficult situation. You actually uh, brought up something that I thought was interesting because um, I do, my niece uh, said that several of her friends have reached out to their landlords to not say that they're not going to pay, but literally can, can you back the rent off for a month or two? Mm -hmm. So there would not be a repayment of any rent that was not paid at this point. That landlords are actually being open to communication if in fact you are willing to do that mm -hmm. and maybe they can just bring the rent back for a short period of time or something mm -hmm. like that so all the, there's lots on the table right and we're highly encouraging that I mean the, the, the relationship between landlords and tenants in many instances is very positive and we want to make sure that we cultivate that and make sure that this continues in this crisis because both sides are hurting right now everyone's hurting right now and everyone's subject to the pressures and so the, the, the more that we can communicate the better and the more we can get information out, the better. Okay. So we've spoken about it again, but there are several resources for people to gain information about the constantly changing scenario in front of us. And so let's, for lack of a better term, refresh everyone's memory in regards to what are the websites, what are the phone numbers, what are some of the things that people can you know, really utilize as a resource mm -hmm. for understanding this process. Okay, so one um, resource, if um, the public wants to know if their unit falls under the rent stabilization ordinance, mm -hmm. and that matters for the issue of rent increases, is the text it number. The text it is to text RSO to 855-880-7368. Now the general information number, where we have, as we mentioned, we have expanded hours. We're, we're open on weekends now. Uh, where we're fielding all kinds of calls from landlords and tenants is 866-557-7368. Um, you notice they both end in 7368. That yes. spells rent. Oh, interesting. Uh -huh. And then we have a wealth of information on the website that is being updated, I would say, every day. So we have sample notification letters, uh, suggested repayment um, arrangements, and just lots of great information about the various protections that the city of Los Angeles has adopted. You've been very gracious in translating one of my questions for our Spanish audience, but what languages are available for people to uh, have someone to chat with, you know, at the Housing and Community Investment Department? Um, so all of our staff, or majority of our staff, are bilingual Spanish-English. Uh, which are the bulk of our calls, but we do have a translation service where for any call we can get an interpreter on. So we literally can help uh, people of 
all languages. We and a lot of our materials is uh, translated into not just English and Spanish, but Korean, Armenian, Russian, Chinese, Tagalog, just a number of. And that translation uh, work is continuing with these new forms and information pieces. So um, the the other languages. Spanish and English are up now. Sure. The other languages should be up in two or three days. Okay. Well, I, I really want to thank both of you, Rushmore and Anna, and I also want to thank Rick Pope, who is our ASL interpreter, um, and keep doing the good work. And I really appreciate you spending the time with us and getting all of the information out there. Thank you. Thank you. So.